please welcome Joe Robertson. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm CCL's Global Strategy Director. Um, I'm going to share a report from the field. Uh, but this is also a story about you, this family of people doing this hard work with quiet daring and open, committed spirits. We're working to build a global community of engaged citizen climate advocates. And we now have 125,000 volunteers spread across six continents. We're active observers and curators of insight in the UN climate negotiations, where we focus on citizen participation, carbon pricing, and climate smart finance. Our Engage for Climate toolkit helps people anywhere produce structured guidance for negotiators on the global stage and supports the principle that all people everywhere are climate stakeholders with the right to be represented in the policy process. Since 2015, we've been convening diplomatic dialogues. Leaders in these dialogues have consistently said that they need science-based insights that non-science decision makers can act on so they can easily make climate smart choices. The result of that process of discussion, that demand, and a wide brainstorming effort is something called Resilience Intel. It's an effort to connect earth science data to finance to give them that extra push. Our volunteers in Europe have embarked on a focused initiative to require the European Union to consider carbon fee and dividend across the Union. And so with these volunteers, we're starting up an organization called Citizens Climate Europe to help catalyze citizen engagement across the continent. So the work we do is not only about solving climate change. We want to ensure all people everywhere can be included in and benefit from climate solutions. Which brings me to our closing keynote speaker. Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali has worked for more than two decades to empower people in communities that are often unseen, unheard, and forgotten so they can move from surviving to thriving. He's done this work with over 500 communities in the US and internationally, from Flint, Michigan, to Gwich'in communities in the Arctic. In 2007, he became a congressional fellow in the office of Congressman John Conyers where he worked on foreign policy in Africa and South America, homeland security, health care, veterans affairs, and environmental justice. Let that just sink in for a minute when you think about meeting with staff on Capitol Hill. They do hard work. He worked at the Environmental Protection Agency for 24 years, where he served as the Assistant Associate Administrator for Environmental Justice and Senior Advisor for Environmental Justice and Community Revitalization. He led the 17 agency interagency working group on, em on environmental justice. In 2017, Dr. Ali joined the Hip Hop Caucus as senior vice president of climate, environmental justice, and community revitalization. He's a former instructor at West Virginia University and Stanford, and has lectured at Harvard, Yale, GW, Georgetown, Spelman College, Albany U Law School, and Howard University School of Law. He's a board member for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Union of Concerned Scientists, TREE, and Climate Hawks Vote. He's now National Wildlife Federation Vice President for Environmental Justice, Climate, and Community Revitalization. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali.
Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, let's try it again. Maybe I need to go on this side of the room. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. That's what I'm talking about. Because sometimes when we work on the issues that we work on, sometimes we forget that we actually have the power to win. People have put us in boxes. People have separated, people have separated us. Sometimes they marginalize the things that we are focused on. And sometimes we have to embrace the moment that we actually have power that we can actually win. Now they told me that I have about 40 minutes with you all this afternoon. And for those of you, and I see a lot of friends and family who's in the room, many of you know that I was raised in a family of Baptist and Pentecostal ministers. And y'all know that it takes us a good 15 to 20 minutes just to say good morning. <laughs> so I don't know what we're gonna do with that 40 minutes. And also those of you who know me know that I always give honor to my mother and my grandmother who are the rocks that I stand on. And by a show of hands, how many folks in the room like your mom or your grandma? Raise your hand high if you do. Everybody look around, find that person don't like their grandma. We're going to find out what's really going on. But being raised in the family that I was, there's some responsibility that comes with that. And that means that my mom and my father always told us that we had to find a way to give back and to help to make real change happen. And also, my mother told me when I was really young, she said, son, she said, you're going to have some tough days. By a show of hands, how many people in the room have ever had a tough day? Raise your hand if you ever had a tough day. Everybody look around. Run over and touch that person never had a tough day. You should have touched them before the Powerball and Mega Millions got one the other day, but you know, we'll work that out. But my mom and my grandmother, they shared with me when they told me to realize I was going to have some tough days that I'm going to need to surround myself with positive energy, surround myself with positive people. Now, we got the positive people thing down today because as you look around, you are surrounded by folks who get it. You don't have to convince them. There are others that we have to make sure that we are sharing the right information with them in the right format that will resonate with them so that they can also become a part of this team, a part of this army, a part of this collective that allows us to be able to protect our planet, to save our lives and to save others' lives. But my mother told me, she said, find those words of empowerment. So every day, since I've been 16 years old, I've used these words, except for twice. And I will share with you all those two times, and then you can blame on me what happened on those days. But every day, I get up and I look in the mirror, and I say I'm blessed and highly favored. Now, I know I might have some heathens in the audience tonight. That's all right. But let's try it. I'm blessed and highly favored. And some of y'all didn't even believe it, so neighbor, help your neighbor. I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And, highly and highly favored. Now this time, say it so the folks down there on Pennsylvania Avenue can actually hear you so they know that you're coming and the folks who are up there on Capitol Hill know that you are coming tomorrow. I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And, highly and highly favored. You see, you truly are because we have the opportunity to actually help save lives. We have the opportunity to save this planet, but it's going to take a lot of work, and it's also going to take us finding ways to work together to make real change happen. Now, people will often have these conversations about climate that are not connected to everyday people. This formula that I've been using over the years, if Mrs. Ramirez doesn't get it, and if Mr. Johnson doesn't get it, then we got a lot of work to do to help them to be able to understand the connections that are there and to also learn from them. And if our policies, and trust me, I have advised White Houses, I've worked on Capitol Hill, I've worked for EPA, if our policy is not connected to everyday people, then what are we doing? We've got more work to do. That means that sometimes we have to spend some time sitting on the back porches of folks. That sometimes means that we got to sit in people's kitchens and have some conversations. Now, I'm just a country boy. People see these suits and all this other kind of stuff, and they don't realize that I come from Appalachia. So when you come from there, you just need to make it simple and make it plain, and also make sure that whatever you're sharing with me is going to help my life to be able to move forward. Now, that's probably a message that resonates across the country, but sometimes we lose that as a part of our conversation. Sometimes, and I've worked, I've been so blessed, I thank God all the time, I've worked with some of the best scientists in the world, and they start talking about parts per trillion, and parts per billion, and parts per million, and all of that is important. But I'm like, how does that play 
with folks who are in Muncie, Indiana? How does that play with folks who are in New Mexico or who are in Maine? Does it make sense to them? So I've developed this formula that I've used over the years that seems that whether I'm in West Virginia or if I'm in North Dakota, it seems to connect with folks and then I connect it to climate change. I should share with everybody that I ran track in college, so in my mind, everything is moving in seconds. So I'm gonna ask you all a quick question. By a show of hands, how many folks in the last 60 seconds have taken a breath of air? If you're taking a breath of air, raise your hand. <laughs> everybody look around, everybody look around, keep your hands up, find the non-air breathers. <laughs> Silly question, right? Mustafa, it's an autonomic response, it's something that we do. We just breathe in and we breathe out and we assume that there's gonna be something positive that's gonna go inside of our bodies. But we know that in our policy, we have to connect it to the real things that are happening in people's lives. We know that there are far too many locations across our country where people can't take a breath of fresh air, which is tied to the impacts that are happening from climate change because of the things that are placed inside of certain communities that is helping to warm up our planet. Everybody do me a favor, take in a deep breath. Just hold it for one second, because we move much too fast in the life that we're currently living. Now let it out, I don't need anybody passing out. We got places, and you've seen some of the slides behind me before, you know, places like Southwest Detroit, so that when you go there, and you have the Marathon Refinery, which is tied to the work that we do, where people literally can't take a breath of fresh air. They can't even literally take a breath of air because of the impacts that are happening in their communities. You guys saw a photo also of Cesar Chavez High School. How many folks have ever been to Houston? So everybody look around. Now, of the hands that are up, how many folks have ever been to the Ship Channel in Houston? So far fewer hands are now up. And how many folks have ever been to the Manchester community in Houston? We have two hands, three hands in our room. If you go to the Manchester community, you will literally be driving. How many folks in the room got an old car? Watch this, ain't nobody gonna put their hands up. <laughs> so a few folks put their hands up. Okay, leave your hands up if you got an old car. We're gonna find out if you really got an old car if it's a classic car. <laughs> Somebody said 12 years. So how many folks got a car that you got to roll the windows down? <laughs> you see how it changed, the dynamic changed real quick? <laughs> There are a few folks, so some folks, we're going to say you got a classic car, okay? We're in that classic car. We're in Houston, driving through the ship channel, going to the Manchester community, a community that is very similar to the communities that some of the folks are sitting in this room. Hardworking community, primarily a Latino community. And when you get there and you roll down those windows in that classic car, you literally feel like you are breathing in gasoline fumes. That's the reality that people are dealing with. And when we are thinking about our policies, we have to connect it to the realities that many of our frontline communities, many of our most vulnerable communities are dealing with so that we are building that team, building that network of individuals that are gonna be so critical if we truly want to win on climate change. Does that make sense to everyone? In that Manchester community, here's the other dynamics that as we are thinking and strategizing and pushing our elected officials to do the right thing, people can literally stand in their backyards and reach their arms out. Everybody just reach your arm out, your left arm. If you don't know which one's your left, ask your neighbor. Because <laughs> I see some people messed it up already, but we're not going to put the camera on them. <laughs> Imagine where you live as you are advocating for policy that if that was your reality, what would you be asking for? What would be the necessary components that get you engaged in that process? Folks who can literally reach out and touch the piping that exists inside of facilities. And for those of us who have been blessed to live in areas where we have plenty of trees and greenery and those types of things, that is not the reality that those folks are dealing with. For as far as the eye can see, they are seeing facilities, they are seeing piping, they are seeing flaring. That same flaring that many of us work on to have regulated so that those emissions are not going up into the atmosphere and warming up our planet and warming up our oceans and causing this climate chaos and crisis that we continue to see. This should never be, this should never be a partisan issue. 
clean air is a human right. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, Republican, or independent, your children deserve to be able to breathe clean air. By a show of hands, in the last 24 hours, how many folks have taken a drink of water? <laughs> or a beverage? Because <laughs> I know how some conferences are when we get away from home. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? I know when I was growing up, you know, I was blessed to, to grow up in a little teeny tiny community, about 500 people. We just knew that when you turned on the tap, that there was something that was going to be positive that's coming out that's going to be able to go into your body. But yet, we still have all of these communities across our country that our policy is failing. And it didn't just start failing under the current administration. Let's have real talk. We have needed to be tougher and smarter and more innovative on that policy as well for a long time. Everybody knows what happened in Flint, Michigan. Is there anybody in the room who doesn't know what happened in Flint, Michigan? One hand went up, that's okay. So we understand the impacts of lead and this toxic pollution that continues to impact communities. And the scary thing is, is that there are over 3,000 locations that have higher levels of lead in their water than Flint does. That should scare people. That, once again, should be an issue that it doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, or Independent, you should be all over it. And we're responsible if we allow any politician to not be laser focused on the policies that need to be put in place to protect our children. Think about that for a second. Close your eyes. I want you, and I'm hoping, that this will resonate with folks. I want you to think about whether it is your child, your grandchild, your nieces, your nephews, your godchildren. I want you to think about what you would do to keep them safe, to keep them protected. That's what this work is about. That's about this generation and the generations that are to come. And we've got a lot of challenges. Now, I know that we in this room are focusing on climate change, but everybody understands the connections. You can open your eyes. Because <laughs> I saw some people that's like this. <laughs> They're like, lunch was so good, so good. And Mustafa's voice was so soothing. That's why I fell asleep. It wasn't that he was boring me. It was because it was soothing. You know, we also have to be focused on all these other water quality issues that are also tied to the impacts that are happening in relationship to climate impacts. Everything, and we gotta get really, really focused, y'all, because there's a lot of super, super intelligent folks who are in the room. And we've gotta get focused on this PFAS and PFOA issues that are going on. We've gotta get focused on the coal ash issues that are going on. I don't know how many of you have ever spent any time in communities that have been impacted by coal ash, but it's amazing to see some of the public health impacts that are happening, the cancers that are happening, the liver and kidney diseases that are happening, the COPD, all of these various things that are associated with the exposures of not only coal ash. And of course, we're now beginning to understand the impacts that are happening from PFO and PFOS around kidneys and cancers and those types of things, but all the other things that I talked about as well. We have a chance now to bring people together to make real change happen. And the scary thing is, is that people will still continue to tell us that we can't win, that we can't do it, that there's not enough money. Now, we're blessed that we have some elders who are in the room today, uh, along with the youth. So for the elders, the question is, do you remember when people told us that we'd never get lead out of gasoline and that the economy would crash and we would destroy the auto industry if we did that? and they were wrong. Now, for those of you who are hunters and fishermen who might be in the room, or just those who enjoy the outdoors, there was a time when we had this thing called acid rain, and where our lakes and streams were being destroyed. And they told us that if we made the steps to actually address this, that we would kill the economy. And once again, they were wrong. This same playbook that folks have been using for years and years, for decades and decades, 
they dust it off once again to tell us that we can't win on climate change. It's the same one, and I would think they would go out and hire somebody to get some new stuff. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's the same thing that they told us about cigarettes. They told us that cigarettes is healthy at first. If you go back and really look at some of the early advertisements, they found the greatest actors who were cool, and they'd put the little cigarette in their mouth, let it hang down, flick the ashes. And then people started to notice there was something happening. So then they said, well, maybe it's not perfect for you. But if you drink some orange juice and have a smoke, you'll be all right. And then that progression of more information and science playing a role in documenting the impacts that were happening, and doctors playing a role in documenting what was happening. So you see how people try and play around with science to manipulate policy. And that's where we come in, helping to push and make sure that the right information is in front of folks, making sure that information is in a format that resonates with people, and making sure that that information is actually coming from people to make real change happen. You guys have seen some of these slides. This one is really important, because sometimes people don't talk enough about a just transition. They don't talk enough about the people who've been working in the fossil fuel industry over the years, and how there is a culture that's there, and we have to honor that culture, but also help people to understand that there are new and better opportunities that exist so that they can be able to take advantage of that. And sometimes for those of us who work in the environmental space, who work in the climate space, we get caught up in this cat and mouse game where it has to be my way and it's the only way without realizing that there are other folks who are living their lives and who have been surviving and we want to help them to move to thriving. Does that make sense to everyone? So how do we win? We win by beginning to build a much larger, stronger, well-educated base. Now, I want everybody to do me a favor, and everybody knows there's a bunch of my friends who are in here, and I love everybody. Is it all right if I give you all some real talk? Everybody say real talk. Real talk. All right, I'm going to have you sign the contract here. Say anything one more time. Real talk. real talk. All right, I want everybody to look around the room. Look around the room. Look at who you, who's, who's in your row or who's in the rows beside you. Who's missing? Real talk, right? Y'all was like, damn, I wish I hadn't said a real talk. <laughs> think about it. I want you to think about it. So if we know, and I want to tie it into some things, so we got 200, between 100 and 200,000 people who are dying prematurely from air pollution every year. We got 25 million people who have asthma. How many folks know somebody who has asthma in the room? Everybody look around. So that's almost every person in this room. Seven million kids have asthma. And disproportionately, it's African-American and Latino children who are the ones who are going to the emergency. know a number of the people who are in this room and many of you are working on that but we need everybody working on it does that make sense to everybody you just saw a slide that went by that talks about our national parks 96 percent of our national parks are now suffering from air pollution our national parks how is that possible in the United States of America that's why we have to be focused on this, and this gives us an opportunity to pull in a whole new set of folks who participate in the outdoors, who care about that, who climb, who repel, who kayak, all these things. It's a new set of opportunities because they want to protect that. So together we can come and make real change happen. If you're one of those folks who loves wildlife, 
and endangered species. You saw a slide sometime that went by that said, and you guys saw the report that came out four weeks ago, that a million species may go extinct. A big part of that is tied to the pollution. Some of it is deforestation. Some of it is some of the hunting practices in other places. It gives us an opportunity to connect with those who care about those issues as well. Building some real authentic collaborative partnerships. Here's the other space that is going to be a huge driver moving forward. And I hope you all are thinking critically about it. Artists and entertainers. Now, the beauty of being at the Hip Hop Caucus is that I was surrounded by a number of them. But if you really want to break down those isms and schisms that exist, if you really want to break down these barriers and these walls and build real bridges, then you've got to use the arts. People through poetry, through music, from country music to hip hop. Those who are in the visual media and those who are in the written media, those have to be a part of your coalition if you want to win. If you want to attract young people and culture and the arts is not a part of it, then you are spinning your wheels and you are missing an opportunity to connect with folks who are far and wide. And then if you're really good, if you're really, really good, you want to begin to get athletes also engaged. Think about who needs to have clean air and clean water and who needs the planet to be protected even more than athletes. As an athlete, I know how hard it is to compete at a top level if there's one thing that's off. Imagine if you are an athlete and that example that we had of the Manchester community and that you had to grow up in there, it probably would make it really difficult as time goes by to be able to compete at a high level. All of these are important. And of course, we have to address our diversity issues. And you all know what needs to be done in that space. But my grandmother says that when you know better, do better. Somebody else knew my grandmother? <laughs> Let's try it again. When you know better, when you know better, all right, so y'all know what needs to happen. The next time we have this conference, we're going to make sure that even more folks are invited into this space, and we're going to do what's necessary to make sure that they can be sitting with us, marching with us, and make real change happen. So how many folks in the room? How many folks in the room believe that you have power? All right, so let's see. How many folks in the room, when you were in elementary school, had a class on power? Anybody? No, 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 no power classes in elementary school. How about junior high school? You had some power? No? All right. High school, power 101. We got two people, one and a half. They weren't sure. They're like, I might have power. I might not have power. All right. Sometimes when we get to college, we begin to understand the dynamics that happen in that space. We may have a professor who you know, just operates outside the box slightly and begins to teach us about that. And the scary thing is we just looked at our American educational system in relationship to power dynamics and with nobody in this room really getting any. So I want you all to think about something. If you're not taught that you have power, then where do you learn it? Sometimes we're blessed to learn from our family. Sometimes our community will embrace us and help us to understand it. Because if you don't really know that you have power, how do you make change happen? Because then you begin to kind of slide back. And you know, you don't, you're a little afraid sometimes to, to step out there if you don't really believe that, one, not only do you deserve to have power, but that you have it. And then how are you going to utilize it to make real change happen? Now, you see some pictures that are going on with various folks. And how many folks in the room know who Beyonce is? <laughs> you would be surprised some places that I go. <laughs> Beyonce understands power. She understands not just her celebrity, but the platform that she has. And the support that that platform gets, that when she says something, people pay attention to it. And she translates that into helping folks. You guys remember when the hurricanes came through and she came down? And not only did she make sure that people had food and water, but she helped also on some policy things that were going on that were behind the scenes as the process was moving forward. Understanding power. 
but you have to have that on your everyday sort of level. How many folks in the room remember the Women's March? You see, don't none of the men raise their hand. Raise your hand, men. <laughs> now, if we're going to be honest, remember when the first Women's March was coming, they said that a million women would never come together. And remember, it was a bunch of men who said that a million women would never come together. And sisters said, oh, yeah? I got something for you. Not only did they march, hold on to that, but they took the energy from the march, like you have energy in this room today, and they went back home. And they said, and took a look around, and they said, if I can't find somebody who will represent me, I'll do it myself. And now, yeah. And now when you look on county commissions, city councils, state houses, and right up the street here where you all will be tomorrow, when you walk in there, the place looks different. And it's better. Because you have folks who are saying that climate change is real, and we're going to do something about it. They're saying economic disparities are real, and we're going to do something about it. They're saying voting rights need to be protected, and we're going to do something about it. That's power. How many of y'all remember the science march? Somebody said the science march. What is that? <laughs> the science march was interesting. And some of you who know me know that I was there. And you know, it was interesting because people never thought that scientists would come out of their labs. <laughs> they just didn't. And I know a whole bunch of great scientists. I remember they were like, Mustafa, is it OK to come out? And I was like, yeah, come on out. <laughs> and they were like, are you sure? I was like, yes, it's going to be OK. So they stuck their toes out. And they, it got good to them. And they came on out, and they began to march. And can I share something with you all? We'll just keep it in the room. <laughs> they ain't have a whole lot of rhythm. They did. We said left, right, left, right. Don't worry about it, just march. <laughs> but here's the interesting thing. As we have an administration for whatever reason, and we're going to pray for them, that don't believe that science is real and has been manipulating the advisory boards that have been taking science out of the policy decision-making process, we have had scientists who have been reaching out, who have been working with frontline communities and other communities to fill that gap. That's powerful, because they're saying that if our federal government will not do the right thing, then we will get engaged in that process. That's power. How many of you all remember the Youth March? OK, I was going to say. So this is another example of how young people having to take on the burden of protecting and fighting for the planet. And they should never have to stand there by themselves. One, they should never have been put in that position. But we are where we are today. And many of you over the decades have been fighting and pushing and building. So we have to stand in solidarity where this is zero hour and the extinction movement and the folks at the Sunrise Movement, and the HBCU Climate Change Initiative. Yeah, y'all didn't know that, did you? Hundreds and hundreds of young students at HBCUs have been working on climate change and environmental issues and sustainability for a long time. And a shout out to Dr. Robert Bullard and Dr. Beverly Wright, who have been championing that for a long time. If you don't clap for anything else, please clap for that. We have power, but you have to know that you actually have power. And we can actually create the legislation that's going to be necessary to protect our planet. Do me a favor. Look to the person to your left. 
<laughs> Look to the person to your right, which will be the other side. <laughs> See, I'm not even looking because I don't want to mess with nobody. Reach your hand out to the person on your left-hand side. And reach your hand out to the person on your right-hand side. Everybody do me a favor. If you have the ability, please stand. There you go. All right. I want you all to think about something. And we're going to go into some questions and answers. And we'll dive deep on some of this other stuff. But it's important for us to deal with the basics, the foundational elements that are necessary for us to actually win this fight that we are currently in. Dr. Martin Luther King once said that we come to these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. <laughs> Think about the monumental task that's in front of us to win on climate change, to address the disproportionate impacts that are happening in our most vulnerable communities, communities of color, low-income communities, and indigenous populations. We are the ones in solidarity with others who can help to lead and make sure that that actually happens. But we got to get rid of some of our own stuff. I'm going to ask you all a couple of questions that I ask myself by a show of hands. <laughs> See how we did that? <laughs> by a show of hands, how many folks have ever been walking down the street and you got your cell phone in your pocket or in your purse? And it might not even be charged. But you see somebody you don't want to talk to, and you pull it out, and you start acting like you're talking to somebody. <laughs> really? Just me? You see how we separate ourselves sometimes. Or well, here's another one just happened to me the other day. How many times have we gotten on the elevator, and we stare at those numbers that are there? And we're like, Lord, please don't let anybody ask me anything. <laughs> yep. We separate ourselves. We put these walls, these divisions, in between ourselves. And we can't do that anymore. We need everybody. We need to let folks know. And when you grabbed each other's hands, please grab those hands again. <laughs> you should have washed your hands before you came here, you little nasty <laughs> self. <laughs> I want you to think about something. When we touch each other in a respectful way, <laughs> you know, we, you know. It humanizes us, because in far too many situations and instances, we lose track with our humanity, our morality, our spirituality, because we allow ourselves to be separated. Now is the time. The legislation that we're trying to move, the actions that we're trying to make happen are going to require us to embrace our humanity and to know that we're all in this together. So everybody do me a favor. Everybody say power. Power. Yeah, and that was just like this. Wasn't it? <laughs> Let's try it again. Everybody say power. Power. All right, everybody, drop your hands. Put your right hand in the air like it's 1968 at the Olympics. <laughs> Some of y'all will know. And if, for those of you who don't, like you had a Black Lives Matter march, whichever one works for you. <laughs> everybody say power. Now let's take that power, let's focus it, let's make sure that everybody's a part of this, and let's win. I'm Mustafa Santiago Ali. Do we have time for I'll let you handle it. Maybe they one question. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I think we would have taken a day with any one of those three uh, keynotes, right? So there was a group of people who got here days before you and I did. Every morning they get here before you and I do it here in the morning, and they stay after we're here to clean up. They've been doing, all they've been doing is, is making sure that you have a great conference. And that's our CCL interns, and I'd like to have them come up so we can thank them.
So um, on Tuesday, we're going to be giving uh, Representative Rooney our Climate Champion Award this year. And um, you should be able to see a picture on the screen soon. And Ashley's going to bring it up here. <clears throat> this is a beautiful piece of sculpture made by Jim Propes from our West, who started CCL West Virginia. It's a beautiful piece of wood that is designed to be a glacial Calvin. And it says to the Climate Leadership Award presenter, Representative Francis Rooney, he wasn't able to be at our reception Tuesday night, but we were bringing it to his office on Tuesday. And Jim, thank you for designing such a beautiful award for him. <laughs> so um, we came into the conference with 499 appointments scheduled. As of five minutes ago, there were 521. Amy and her team are still at the table just outside the room making phone calls. 27% <laughs> of those are face to face with members of Congress. So that's very cool. So um, a lot of you brought, brought constituent contact forms, you know, we'll be dropping off in the office. 30,184. <laughs> wow. So, uh, 104 breakout sessions, three keynotes, uh, climate advocate training for over 600 people. Uh, I love what Piper Christian said this morning, is, is that one member agreed to sign on to the bill if they just agreed to stop bothering them. <laughs> Please remind people that we will keep showing up until they say yes. <laughs> All right, have a great night, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow morning on the Hill.